let me hit this. Oh, got to share my screen, sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, here we go. So I want to start talking about some of the management frameworks that overlie a lot of our coastal issues here in California. Um, and so uh, we want to talk about the Coastal Commission. But before we talk about the Coastal Commission, we need to sort of make, make sure we have the stage set properly. So when we talk about um, uh, the Coastal Commission and a lot of these things that we have in our um, state, special districts, mosquito abatement, um, uh, 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 resource conservation districts, all these things, they seem normal to us or they might seem um, common. Well, I just, let me step back, let me step back. So tell me what you guys, overall you guys, what were some of your stories that you heard about the Coastal Commission so far? Or that popped into your head? Um, I remember a story about, um, uh, it takes a long time for the permits to go through mm -hmm. for the Coastal Commission. Absolutely. And the person who had mentioned that was talking about it in a negative light. Yep, totally. So bureaucracy, big sort of state bureaucracy. Okay, good. What are, what are a couple other uh, uh, impressions or, or common notions that you guys know about or have heard about or have the impression of? I heard that they are very under-resourced and that they depend on public like involvement to understand like what's going on and like yep. what they fix. Yep. I, I, uh, uh, I think most of our state agencies are under-resourced, but um, I would say certain areas in particular are extremely under-resourced in the Coastal Commission, such as um, uh, enforcement and things of that nature. They don't really do enforcement. Um, they don't necessarily have a huge, uh, now it's, it's sort of broken up into different um, uh, sections and, and divisions, but many of the divisions don't have, you know, adequate technical help. So uh, they need to go outside a lot of times or, or consult with other people. Yeah, good. Other ones, other, other impressions? No other impressions. Um, I took land use planning last semester and mm -hmm. Um, we talked about the court case that gave the Coastal Commission more power. And it, they were talking about a sidewalk easement. And I believe like the homeowners were trying to expand the, like their house on their property. So I would say that paints them in a negative light, depending on your perspective. Right. Yes. Uh, there's always perspective here. Totally. Agreed. Agreed. But in general, I, I suspect the conversation, a lot of the conversation was at least um, something to the effect of, well, I'm an American and private property is protected in the constitution. How can you tell me what to do? I, I suspect um, a lot of it went that way. Um, so uh, what I would say is one of the things that, that the, the, so the Coastal Commission is a super powerful entity. We'll get to it when we, in a few minutes, but, but it's, it really is an extraordinarily um, powerful entity. And um, while it's, you know, maybe the, the apex of that sort of effort of, of uh, management or engagement with uh, decision-making um, power influence, however you wanna phrase it, um, I would say it's actually part of a wide array of different agencies or different groups, um, government agencies, quasi-government agencies that um, have, evolved in California. And so I, I want to put it in the context of that broader movement. And so what we're talking here, I have a few quotes here uh, about um, sort of getting us in the right frame of, frame of mind. And so um, 
we are interested in this notion of sustainability oftentimes, right? We want to make sure that our, our power is cool. We want to make sure that our economy is cool. We want to make sure that our, our property is not falling in the ocean, all these different things. Um, and regionalism um, has come to the fore more and more in recent decades. And the Coastal Commission is but one example of that. So here's a quote um, from uh, about 20 years ago from this guy speaking to these issues. And, he's in, and the quote is, only one approach appears possible to concurrently maintain ecological integrity and basic human needs for the built environment. And that is to plan and manage the urban landscape as only one of several linked landscapes considered together, the group as a whole could then theoretically be sustainable. And so this takes us to this notion of regionalism. And so, it, you know, traditionally it was my, my town, right? My county, um, uh, my state, right? And, and, and our, our notions of who we should engage with, who we should, uh, you know, think about who's getting the benefits, who's, get, who's bearing the brunt of the costs, that kind of stuff has historically been done in a very, um, prescribed manner throughout our, our history, right? It was, it was our tribe, it was our little territory, it was our king's kingdom, that, that type of stuff. Um, and this new thing has begun to emerge as we become more and more worried about things like sustainability. And so here's another quote from this uh, regional leadership uh, committee. And they defined regional planning as in the simplest analysis, this means that economic activity, ecology and social life are not bound by tradition or conventional political jurisdictions. What are conventional political jurisdictions? They are the uh, limit of the incorporated town. They are the limit of the county, that type of stuff. And so this notion of um, trying to deal with sustainability started bumping up into all these um, artificial barriers, all these political barriers, political not, not meaning uh, what party you're in, but, but a construct, a human construct saying this is where jurisdiction starts, this is where jurisdiction ends. And with a growing number of things, you guys can name off the top of your head, climate change, uh, we, we're experiencing Santa Ana's right now, right? So the winds are starting in one part of the state or maybe even another state, Arizona, depending on, on where we are, blowing into us, we're pulling air pollution from that area into us. So there's air pollution. There's right now we're in the middle of this um, COVID thing, right? And so a uh, travel is beginning to, not beginning to, it has been impacted, right? So if we want to travel to, I don't know, Disneyland or whatever, can't just travel to Disneyland, right? There's some, there's some additional levels of planning. So all this stuff is, is um, taking an approach that is, pushing beyond the traditional uh, constricted areas. Um, and then a couple, a couple of continuing that idea, the more complicated analysis suggests that every place and every issue is best addressed at the spatial level that enables us to understand how that particular region works and how it can be acted upon. So we're talking now about um, fitting the correct scale. So our political jurisdictions maybe don't match the scale of the sustainability challenge, that kind of thing. So the idea there is because the scale doesn't work, we need to expand our scale. We need to um, add a broader spatial construct onto what we are thinking about and then ultimately into how we're enforcing things and that type of stuff. So we have three phases here for California. And so I'm breaking this down into um, starting at about 1900, which is really when we start getting more, um, some of our modern, our modern uh, infrastructure and things of that nature. Obviously we have the gold rush and then the 1850s uh, and 60s, civil war, all this kind of stuff. So there was, there was a bit of a kind of shifting around of the state. And really it wasn't until the late 1800s that we really started to have these solid, um, uh, these, these solid sort of political institutions as we would think of maybe an East Coast state or something of that nature, right? That we get our robber barons, 
we get um, you know, the, the Leland Stanfords of the world that start to become the governor and a senator and you know, all this and stuff. So, so we're gonna start at around 1900 for convenience. So in this first phase of our state, we had a lot of home rule, meaning you know, very, very locally focused stuff. Um, if you're on a uh, ranchero in the, in the Central Valley, you're pretty much focused on what's going on in that ranchero area. Um, we're beginning to add in some in infrastructure, just beginning to really get uh, start to tiptoe down the route to modern infrastructure. Um, our uh, railroads were the first real thing that really started that. Um, the county starts to become um, more prominent in terms of passing laws and regulations and sheriff activities and things of that nature. And we start to see uh, efforts of consolidation of power in some regional centers. And so that's going to be in Los Angeles and in San Francisco. As we go into the next phase, and we go into sort of the, the post-World War II kind of era, mid-century era, um, we get into this uh, suburbanization, right? So we have a lot of folks that move to California because of the war effort or because of the Dust Bowl. In the Great Depression and people were starving and so they came to California, this promised land to, to find work and that, this and that. Regardless of what brought people here, a huge influx of, of new folks. And this really, uh, because we're no longer, the power centers are, are not necessarily in the cities anymore, now we're starting to get this fragmentation of political power. So there's no boss, as it were, sort of running the show and deciding how we're going to do stuff, you know, rightly or wrongly. And so uh, in this second phase, as I mentioned, we had this increased, uh, one of the most important things is this increased suburbanization. We start to get more single purpose state dominated planning. So an entity that wants to bring water and deal with move water around the state, right? An entity that wants to deal with um, the new electrical grid and how we're gonna do that. Um, and, we're and, and so we start to, and so we, 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 we have this single purpose entity um, push going on. And then we're starting to get some initial institutions, um, council of governments, different uh, uh, folks trying to deal with things in the San Francisco Bay Area or other places where they're starting to realize maybe we need to start to come together and be less, um, less specific and be a bit more general about um, talking to people, engaging with people. And so this begins to um, foster agencies that have stronger authority and that, and that are um, more narrowly focused. So as we start to expand and say, hey, we got to work on this, people are nervous. They say, well, we don't want you to become a, you know, another legislature or something like that. But, um, but if you're going to deal with water pollution, if you're going to deal with getting me electricity, maybe that's okay. So as we get this stronger authority in these, in these institutions, um, the power and the focus generally gets more um, targeted. Uh, and those that, are, those that are very broadly targeted usually can't do much and they tend to be really weak. So the power brokers, the ones that have a very narrow mandate and very clear purpose. Then we move into the modern era. Um, we might be in a fourth phase now. I'm trying to figure it out. I don't know. I don't really know what to call it. We, we seem to have entered this strange uh, phase in the last decade or two. But for now, we're just gonna talk up to, the two, up to 2000. Um, and so in this area, uh, we really start to get pinched with the um, uh, Arab oil, oil embargo, um, problems with transportation, uh, huge uh, delays in terms of traffic jams, stuff of that nature, and the concomitant rise in environmental concerns. So real worries about air quality, um, people getting asthma in the LA basin, air quality in the Central Valley, et cetera. Pollution um, is another huge one, particularly water pollution. People are very worried about that. And it goes on and on. So as we go from phase one to phase three, we have this increasing maturity of this notion of regionalism and the acceptance of doing policy and management at more of a regional scale as opposed to the county or the city scale. Um, and here's a quote uh, I like. This is, uh, 
This is about um, one of these regional councils, in this case, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and the then president of this organization said, the intensity of concern around transportation and housing suggests we've got this brewing collision. We really view this as reaching crisis proportions and we've got to get these problems solved in the region or it's gonna be a threat to the economy. I think that really some, that really is a nice summary of what's going on here. So, so people, even politicians, even folks that are very worried about a particular, um, uh, a particular issue are, are still usually very leery of going to a regional approach because because they worry that they maybe would lose control, they lose some um, uh, authority and, and some you know have some some entity farther away make decisions for you where you wouldn't have representation. What allows it to go forward is people think not doing it is going to be worse. So not doing it is going to be worse for the economy or not doing it is going to be worse for uh, let's say water pollution or something of that nature. Um, and another quote here, uh, we have to agree that every change creates winners and losers, but we can navigate. We can make a change so that everyone wins in the region as a whole, not just each fiefdom. So not just each little city, but this notion that everybody would benefit. Um, and now the, here, the central problem though, is this last sentence here, which says, we'd love to do that, but we all report to fiefdoms. Yeah. So what we're saying here is, um, uh, what we're saying here is that as we go to this regionalism, yes, that might be the right way to deal with the pollution. That might be the right way to deal with traffic congestion, but no one is elected to this regional body, right? I'm elected to my city council. I'm elected to my county board of supervisors or what have you. And so, so there, this, these regional planning entities remain a bit squirrely. Okay, here are some of our existing um, entities that exhibit regionalism in California. So we have air pollution control districts. Um, we have airport land use commissions. We have councils of governments. These are all over the place. We have, and I, I should say some of these councils of, most of these councils of government are geographically defined. There are some though that are for, you know, large cities or small cities, but here we're mostly talking about ones that are, um, uh, functioning in a, in a specific geographic region. So San Diego um, Association of Governments or uh, Bay Area Association of Governments, that kind of thing. Uh, solid waste management plans and, uh, and committees, regional transportation planning agencies, and then uh, California regional water quality control boards. Uh, these, these entities all operate or can operate across the state. And then we have other entities that are um, specific to just one region. So for example, we have the, the, the state air pollution control, control board that's comprised of several sub districts or, or regional districts that deal with the air, the same with water. Um, we have the Metropolitan uh, Transportation Commission in the Bay Area. We have the Tahoe Regional Planning Commission up in the Sierras um, uh, and so forth. And then um, perhaps the, the granddaddy of them all that we want to talk about in our class here in particular is the California Coastal Commission, which obviously, as we mentioned before, operates on in, in the coastal zone as defined legally by what we mean by the coastal zone. Um, so very specifically uh, restricted, although it does operate up and down from the Oregon border down to the uh, Mexican border. Other example, makes sense so far? Everybody cool? Any questions? Yes. Okay, let's talk about a couple other uh, examples here before we get to the Coast Commission. I'm trying to pick up some examples here that uh, are, are distinct from, uh, you know, California coastal zone so that we can just see examples. So one would be the Portland, Portland Metropolitan Service District or Portland Metro. This was formed in, again, the third phase. This was formed in 1978 as an elected regional government. So this entity is gonna operate beyond the boundaries of a given city or so. Um, and even indeed beyond the boundaries of any one county or so. But in this case, there's direct election to be on the, to, to be on the board. Um, and so this entity 
this regional entity consists of three different counties and 24 cities in the greater Portland area. Um, yeah, right, okay, there we go. And, and the charter was approved by two thirds of all the voters in all these districts, okay? So the voters in the three counties, the voters in the 24 cities, et cetera. And what they were focused on, their, their, their primary focus is on uh, managing development, managing growth, and uh, not letting, in this case, Portland become an unlivable city, right? So there's all these things that have all these priorities about uh, green space, et cetera, but they're really focused on um, making sure that one city doesn't say have all the parks or one city has all the um, uh, in industry, that kind of stuff. And so these are all the things that they've uh, worked on, land use planning, transportation planning, green space is a huge one, um, dealing with the zoo, which you might think, wow, what does the zoo matter? But actually the zoo is a, is a huge uh, draw and a huge um, tourist pull and this and that. And so there, there are benefits and costs, right? If, if the city, if, excuse me, if the um, zoo is in one city's jurisdiction, so that city is getting all the tax revenue, but then you're clogging up the streets in some other neighboring city, and they, they go get no benefit, that's a problem, right? So the idea is let's manage this regionally so that everybody gets some kind of benefit. And then various sort of uh, development things. Um, and, uh, and I'll highlight one in particular, which is really central for us, which is uh, number two on my, or the second bullet on the right column here, which is maps and data. One of the things just about everybody can agree upon with these regional entities is the fact that um, we oftentimes have a dearth of data or at least don't have data that's readily accessible or readily useful. So one of the things, if, it, if a regional entity is going to do anything, it's going to do some studies and it's going to pull together data and oftentimes make that data transparent. So this can be really, really key. So this could be doing, say, traffic studies. This could be doing some, uh, uh, you know, whatever, whatever data collection and integration that can be really helpful for um, moving forward. Hopefully, that regional entity does more than that. But at a minimum, data collection, data generation, data transparency are really key there. And so we'll just look at uh, one of these uh, aspects, which is this which is uh, protecting fish and wildlife habitat in this um, big urban city. And so they ultimately decided in 2001 to follow this multi-step program and um, they uh, mapped what was going on. And so you can see the city over here, or, or excuse me, you can see the uh, jurisdiction over here on the right. Portland is in the, the middle. And um, they went about figuring out how they could uh, better um, restore or protect the streams in there that are salmon bearing. Uh, and it's, it's, it's been a, a successful uh, approach so far. Um, okay, so uh, some of the challenges that we see um, is as these things start to uh, be in existence for more than a year or two or three, there's, there can be this divergence of, of policy priorities. So sometimes we get a city that really says, we don't want any new houses here, or we don't want any affordable housing here or something of that nature. And, uh, and, and there's sometimes div divergence between that city or that, that um, traditional power center and the regional entity working around it. Um, there's oftentimes not great enforcement. So again, collecting data, maybe proposing some studies, maybe suggesting this, but when you have an actor that, that specifically goes against the, the spirit or the practice of the plan or the proposal, there's oftentimes not many teeth there to push back or, or there aren't many um, tools for the entity, for the members of the organization to push back and say, no, 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 you can't put your parking lot there or what have you. Um, right, so in general, when we talk about, hey, how are we gonna improve the traffic? In, in the broad sense, in the general sense, everybody's like, yeah, let's do this. But when it comes down to the individual person 
and we want to put a new road in front of your driveway, that individual person says, yo, 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 no, I don't like that, right? So there's this constant tension between sort of the, the net good or, or the, the aggregate notion of what we should be doing and the individual um, impact and the impact on individuals who don't like the impact and then want to push back. Um, so that, that's, just, that's just sort of built into the system. And that takes us to the California Coastal Commission, right? So all this stuff perfectly applies to the California Coastal Commission. Uh, the California Coastal Commission got going because of two things. One thing in Northern California, one thing in Southern California. In Southern California, it was Malibu uh, and, and just the, the absolute de crazy development in Malibu that was happening in the 60s, uh, post-World War II, but particularly in the 60s. And at the same time, um, essentially a hippie commune up in Northern California, north of San Francisco, this area called Sea Ranch. And so as you can tell from this, uh, or maybe you can tell from this image, this, this old photo, um, we're looking at uh, development, but it's not a traditional development. So um, the idea here was to have people live on the coast, uh, live uh, far away from a big urban center, but do so uh, with a bunch of artists and do so with a big creative interest. And so everything from the architecture to the siting of the buildings, et cetera, was, was thought out and you know, all this kind of stuff. This was, this was the 60s and all this kind of, all this kind of interesting time. Um, and uh, so the architecture was very funky. Um, at first people said, who's gonna move all the way up here where there aren't, uh, you know, there, there isn't, uh, there's, there's no Amazon delivering things back then. And, and all this and that. And so it started off with this idea that everybody will have access. We'll just have a little, almost like a timeshare. We'll just have a little, um, you know, our little apartment or a little parcel, but then the rest of the grounds will be communal. And we can go on hikes and look at the wind and, and wind blowing the grass, or we can watch the waves break and it'll be very romantic and all this kind of great stuff. Well, uh, without spoiling what happens to Sea Ranch, uh, long story short is, um, it, it starts to uh, it, it starts to not become the idealized place that everybody thought it would be or, or some of the founders hoped it would be. And it starts to become this relatively expensive enclave and a desirous place to live. And as that starts to happen, access to the coast that was supposedly guaranteed begins to be cut off. Um, and then gates go up and privacy starts entering into it and all this and that. So Sea Ranch in the north, Malibu in the South, people start saying, hey, what's going on? We don't, we don't like what's going on. And so using the proposition um, pathway, uh, the initiative pathway, which was started originally to break the power of the robber barons that had controlled the state legislature and people felt that, that all these politicians were corrupt in the early Gilded Age. Um, and so we came up with this idea that this direct democracy thing, that the citizens can just put something together. And so that's what actually happened. And so folks put together this proposal. It did not go to the legislature. It went to a vote, just like we're all going to have in a, in a few weeks, a couple of weeks. Um, and, uh, and it passed, basically. And it freaked everybody out. It freaked all the politicians out. And so they're like, oh my God, this was, a, this was a huge change in the management of the coastal zone. Well, huge change in the management of the state in general, but in particular, a huge change in what was going on with the coast. And so the state legislature was like, whoa, 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 we want to have a hand in this. So they then went and passed the California Coastal Act four years later that um, uh, changed, modified, et cetera, and cod codified the, Cal, uh, the, the provisions of the Coastal Act into the state constitution. So this wasn't just a regular old law that we're gonna do this. This is actually really hard to change, at least the core tenets of it. And uh, that make, that's one of the reasons it has so much power. And so the um, Coastal Act was charged with, uh, and, the, and the, the Coastal Commission that was created from the Coastal Act were charged with protecting, maintaining, and enhancing the overall quality of the coastal zone environment and its natural and artificial resources. So artificial resources would be harbors, uh, ports, things of this nature. They also speak to a balanced utilization of resources. This is really key. Um, 
another key one that that a lot of uh, um, my fellow faculty focus a lot on is public access, right? So you guys, I'm sure have heard this if you've taken Dr. Ryman's, any of Dr. Ryman's classes or, or probably some of Dr. Patch's classes, et cetera, but this idea of maximizing public access to the coast. So um, this, is the, this is the law that guarantees us access to the coast between highest high tide and lowest low tide, no matter what's going on, unless there's some military or uh, uh, security reason why we can't be there, meaning nuclear power plant or something, not big fancy movie stars wedding. Um, uh, and then ensure priority for coastal dependent development and coastal dependent e economics, coastal dependent businesses. So for example, um, we don't necessarily want to protect a tape manufacturing plant or a um, or a recording studio or something of that nature that could be anywhere in the state of California. But the Coastal Act does say we do want to protect uh, fishing activities. We want to protect yeah, canning uh, activities, um, that type of stuff. So stuff that really needs to be at or very near the coast um, to do the nature of its business. And then uh, lastly, uh, coordinate the planning and development of all the activity in the coastal zone. When you talk to different people, they will say, oh, the most important thing about the Coastal Act is public access, or the most important thing is balanced utilization. The reality is these are all priorities and goals of the Coastal Act. Um, uh, importantly, the California Coastal Commission, which is the entity that enacts the act, um, they were given authority over all new coastal development. Existing coastal development was grandfathered in so if we want to go and if you wanted to open up a restaurant right now um, that was in a cove in Malibu, um, you're almost assuredly not going to be able to get a permit to do that, right? Because when you put in the restaurant, you're going to be changing the, the um, public access, you're going to be doing all this kind of stuff. So you probably will not get that. However, we do have places like Paradise Cove, right, that exist. Paradise Cove only exists in Malibu because it was grandfathered in, because it predated the Coastal Commission. So we have this, um, uh, tension isn't the right word, but we just have this built-in dichotomy because this law went in after all of this housing stock, energy pipelines, all this stuff had already uh, been approved and already been in existence. So we have primarily focus on new development. With that existing development, whenever something goes awry, so if a pipeline breaks, if a home catches fire and has to be rebuilt or something like that, um, then they have to come get um, a, a permit and they have to seek permission and approval from the Coastal Commission. Um, but, uh, but if they had an existing home that didn't need any work or an existing pipeline that didn't need any work, they don't technically need to get um, uh, uh, approval uh, to continue to operate it as they historically have. Uh, the basic idea here with, with regards to development stuff broadly writ is you are the homeowner and you want to do something and so you submit it to your uh, local state or, or excuse me, your local city or county entity. I want to put in a new extension on my house. Okay, go to your, your city building ordinance and sort of make sure it meets all the codes and everything. But then if I'm within the coastal zone jurisdiction, recall that this is not our definition. Our definition of the coast is a broad one. Our definition of the coast is the part of the land that's influenced by the sea and the part of the sea that's influenced by the land. So very broad. But the Coastal Commission definition of the coast is a legally defined thing that is highly variable depending on where we are uh, along the coast. In, in the Santa Monica Mountains where campus is, it goes basically to the ridge line or five miles inland, whichever is, is farther. Uh, but again, in areas like downtown San Francisco, downtown Los Angeles, downtown San Diego, places like that, it only might go in a couple hundred feet or so. Um, so assuming my house is, is inside that coastal zone, after I've gone through my local folks, then it has to go to the Coastal Commission. The process is it'll go to staff members, staff members which are regular routine, uh, you know, regular state employees essentially get a paycheck from the state of California. 
and they review it and they, they maybe go out and visit it and they, they do their due diligence and they uh, come up with the technical understanding of what's going on. And then they pass it on to the Coastal Commission itself. So we need to make sure that when we say the Coastal Commission, we understand that we have the commissioners, which are 12 people. There's 12 people and 12 alternates. So if you can't make a meeting, you're, you can send your alternate. Um, and, uh, and then everybody else is, is an employee, right? So they do not have the power to vote. The only decision-making power comes from the commission. So if the staff says we shouldn't allow this house to be built, or they say it, they think it should be built, they might make a recommendation, but the only authority comes from the Coastal Commission. Where do those folks come from? Those 12 are uh, broken up one third, one third, one third. One third are appointed by the governor. One third are appointed by the, the head of the state rules, uh, excuse me, Senate Rules Committee. And then the final third are appointed by the Speaker of the Assembly. There's three people there, governor, senator, assembly, man or woman. And they are the ones that have uh, the power to appoint these folks. People are appointed to a rotating um, um, a period. And they're made, let's see, do I have a slide on this next one? Okay, so they're, they're, they're a mix of folks. So, uh, I mean, the, the folks can appoint whoever they want, but generally speaking, there's an effort to try to have some type of balance. So there's usually a mix of elected representatives. That could be someone who is a city council member or a county supervisor type of person. It could be someone from an NGO, someone from an environmental group or a fishing uh, advocacy group or something of that nature. It could come from a realtor or a business uh, a business lobbyist or something of that nature. Um, also, we strive for some amount of geographic representation. So we don't want everybody from LA. We don't want everybody from the North Coast. There should be some type of broad representation across. So all those things go into the, de the decision framework of the elected representatives. And of course, they're politicians. So there's political uh, favors and things of that nature that, that uh, uh, may enter into it. Um, in, in terms of who they appoint. Okay. Um, questions about that so far? So it's possible that they could have on this board um, people that are actually in the oil and gas industry? Oh, of course. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. Mm. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're a coastal constituent, right? So, I mean, it'll depend on who the governor is and who the politicians are and everything, but, um, but absolutely. So when uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, our, last, our last Republican governor in the state, um, was in charge, um, he appointed some uh, folks that were re Republicans. Um, and, uh, but he's also, he was also you know, a pretty strong environmentalist. So... Um, you know, there's all kinds of, of considerations that go into the mix here. Um, uh, but, but we are, these are politicians appointing people to a political post. So, um, yeah. Other questions? Are there any other forms of accountability for the commission? Interesting. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but if, you mean the elected person or excuse me, the appointed person. So I'm appointed by the governor for my, my term of office, right? Um, uh, I guess I'm not entirely sure. I should ask Charles how this works, but um, if you lost confidence, right? If, if you maybe start doing some crazy stuff, I suppose the governor could unappoint you, right? Because he or she appointed you in the first place. And if they don't like what you're doing, he or she could appoint, appoint a replacement. I think, I'm not 100% I'm not positive how that works, um, but I think, I think that could happen. I think that's how it would happen. I have to check. Other questions? Okay, um, we'll go for a little bit more than take our break. So um, we mentioned the general general idea, which is someone wants, someone wants to do something, and so they need permission, and so they they um, submit their their application or their petition to the to the commission staff. 
they evaluate it, then it goes to the commission itself. Um, you see here, these are the main ways in which uh, the commission um, acts. So first and foremost, it's through coastal development permits. And this says, uh, yeah, you're allowed to do this, this put in this pipeline or whatever the, the case may be. Certification of local coastal programs, more to say about that later, but, but these are typically referred to as, the L, as, as an acronym of LCPs, local coastal programs. Now this says certification of local coastal programs. The Coastal Commission doesn't create the local coastal program, the, the local entity does, the city, the county, depending on where we are on, on the state. Um, and they say, hey, so this, so the, uh, the local coastal program is a blueprint. It's a blueprint for how we're going to behave and, and, uh, and, and essentially decide how we develop for the next decade, two, three decades, something like that. So uh, the entity, the city or the county will work on it, work on it, work on it, revise it, talk to their citizens, talk to their businesses and get some ideas and all this and that. It's usually a multi-year, many, many year thing. In the case of the one that we've been working on with Oxnard, it's, it's been going on for more, well over a decade now. It's almost two decades, I think now. Um, but anyway, um, it's, you know, so going on, going on. Um, and, and then it comes up to the Coast Commission and they have to decide if it uh, is consistent with the Coastal Act. So they might veto it um, or they might make some suggestions, but they're, they're this certifying agency. Uh, and so, so they don't actually do it. They just say whether it's acceptable or not, essentially. The Coastal Commission can also hear for, um, and all of this applies to just stuff in the, coastals, in the coastal zone, right? In, 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 the, in the Coastal Commission definition of the coastal zone. Uh, if my house is, is you know, within, within the coastal zone and I say, hey, I want to put on a, uh, an extra bedroom outside my house. And remember I said I first have to go to the city, the, the, the first level of getting the permits. And I went to the city and they said, nope, this, isn't, this is inconsistent with our local coastal uh, program. So you're not going to be allowed to add an extra bedroom onto your house. I could say that's BS and I could appeal to the Coast Commission. I, I, even though it wasn't approved by the local jurisdiction, I can say, look, you guys, they said this wasn't, so essentially they're, they're a quasi judge here, right? And so, so the, the Coast Commission would say, ah, you know, no, 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 um, uh, this, this guy should be allowed to put on his, um, his uh, extra garage or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So they do that, and then lastly, they they are the entity that figure that um, determines federal consistency determinations in the state of California. This is for stuff relating to development in the coastal zone. So, for example, pipelines coming ashore from an offshore oil rig and things of that nature. Um, okay, uh, I think maybe this is a good place to just take a pause. So we'll take our pause here, take our ten minute break right here, and we'll come back and talk about some of the tensions that can arise in and around the California Coastal Commission. Okay, so I'm going to pause this. We're going to take a 10-minute break. I will see everybody in 10 minutes. Ready, set, go. Okay, guys, fire, <clears throat> firing this back up. Excuse me. <clears throat> Got about another 30 seconds or so. Everybody can see my screen okay? I rebooted everything okay? Let me make sure I got everything on. Yeah, I can see your screen. Thank you. Uh, recording is on. Okay, cool. Okay. Did you mean your share screen or like? Yeah, the, you guys can see my, you guys can see no, my screen, right? No, oh, just we see you. What? What? I'm at least I do. Huh. Horrible. That's horrible. You should be looking at my pumpkin head. Okay. How about? Yep, you're good. How about that? Thank you. Okay. Um, 
So let's let's uh, keep going here and finishing off this intro to the Coastal Commission. So uh, do, I just described a very powerful entity. This is the entity that the United Nations describe as the most powerful land management agency uh, in in the world, at least in a democracy, right? Um, very, very powerful. As a consequence, powerful, influencing which, what happens on say private property or you know influences development, all that kind of stuff. You can imagine that um, not everybody is always gonna be super stoked about the decisions made. And this has um, come up in a lot, uh, a lot of cases. So I'm, I'm trying to steer away from some of the cases that I think Dr. Reinemann has, has talked about in law and policy and some other ones. So I'll just, I'll just mention a couple things. Um, and then I want you guys to go out and go find uh, some other examples. So uh, obviously not everybody likes the California Coastal Commission. The most um, recent huge blow up was a couple years ago when um, this guy, Charles Lester, who's a great dude. So let me step back. So the uh, Coastal Commission has an executive director and this is the person that basically runs the agency day to day. This is a state employee non-elected, right? This is a, a regular, just like someone would be in charge of the water department or the uh, Department of Natural Resources, something of that nature. So regular salaried employee. Um, and they're in charge of all the men and women that work for the um, Coastal Commission and all the offices, et cetera. Oh, yeah, let me, let me step back. Maybe I didn't fully go over that. I probably should put a slide in about that. Um, so uh, offices, offices. The Coastal Commission's main office, you know, headquarters is in San Francisco. But there are regional offices up and down the coast. One of those regional offices is in Ventura. And it just so happens that the current executive director lives uh, close to us. And so um, while sometimes they have to go, you know, he has to go to San Francisco to do certain things, whenever he can, he likes to work out of the Ventura office when possible. So there are offices, you know, necklaced up and down the coast so that everybody has at least a regional office, uh, you know, somewhat nearby, if not, if not next door, at least, you know, an hour or so or two drive, not, not eight hours drive away. Um, and I'll talk about this later, but, but um, the meetings, the Coastal Commission meets monthly, has public hearings monthly. Sometimes there's, they're more frequent than that, but the default is once a month or so. And uh, those move around. So they will be in San Diego, let's say this month, and then they'll be in, uh, I don't know, Big Sur the next month, and then up by Humboldt the next month. And so they're, they're constantly moving around. And so just like the Coastal Commission is distributed up and down the coast, the staff are also distributed up and down the coast, certain offices tend to specialize in different things. So one office might tend to specialize in sea level rise, right? And so the staff that are expert in that are there. Another office might specialize in um, uh, access, you know, coastal access issues. And so they might have, that most of their staff will be concentrated in that, that one particular uh, uh, office or nearby. The Coastal Commission has been very forward thinking in terms of engagement. And so for a long time, they've piloted online. So you can always, for, for years, you've been able to listen to a Coastal Commission meeting, even if you couldn't go. And so that does two things. On any given month's agenda, there will be um, uh, statewide issues, something that applies to the whole, whole state. And then there'll be regional petitions. So if you have, if I have my house, again, I don't live in the coastal zone, but I keep using my house as an example. But anyway, the buy house in the coastal zone. Um, and I wanted to add that extra garage or whatever it is onto it. Uh, I would put my petition in and, you know, it would take months and long time and everything, but eventually it would get around to being heard. When it would be heard, the staff will generally try to hold it uh, you know, when, when it's ready to be heard, so that might take a while, but once it gets to that point, maybe it's ready this month, they might wait two or three months for the hearing that's going to be relatively close to me. So maybe it'll be in Ventura, maybe it'll be in Long Beach, maybe it'll be in Oxnard, something like that, right? 
so that uh, I can be, I don't have to drive super far to be present um, in the meeting. Um, if I really was just like, you know what, dude, this is super, super important. I want it on this month's meeting and this month's meeting happened to be up in Humboldt, that could happen, right? I would, I would want to drive up there probably because in most cases I want to be present there so I can uh, be in the room, provide my testimony, et cetera. Talk to the folks. Um, currently with COVID, it's 100%. So usually I take you guys to a meeting and it's pretty cool. They, the staff will come out and talk to you and everything. Obviously now we can't do that because everybody's socially distanced, but you can, you can, we can still listen to a COSO commission meeting or participate. It's just, it's, it's virtual. Um, but you've always been able to do virtual and in person. Um, and, and, and the meetings are also recorded. So you can also go back in time, not forever in time, but when we started doing the live recordings, you can go back and view those at your uh, leisure. Okay, uh, what else did I wanna say? So, uh, so the, the physical jurisdiction of where the offices are, uh, the meetings move around. Um, yeah, okay, anyway. So uh, not everybody likes the Coast Commission. So, uh, so the, the guy, one of the guys that wrote the proposition uh, and you know, key crafter of the Coastal um, Act was the executive director for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. And then he got uh, sick. He was a great guy. He was very generous to us and always talked to um, my classes very, very uh, professionally and we really appreciated it. He basically got, got uh, ill with cancer and, and had to step down and then passed away, unfortunately. And so his lieutenant, which is this guy, uh, his then lieutenant, Charles Lester, stood up and, and, and took the, the reins and became the new executive director. Great dude. I, in full disclosure, I collaborate with him. I think he's a great guy. I think he's a smart dude. I think he's an excellent advocate for the coast. He's just an all around good nut. Um, uh, and a very professional guy. Um, uh, there was some disagreements as to what was going on. Um, and so some of the Coastal Commission decided they didn't um, like what was going on uh, with uh, Charles and, and, and his leadership style. Now, one of the things, and as someone um, let's see, what should I say? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pause the recording here for a second. I'm going to pause. Okay. Okay, great. Um, other examples that maybe you haven't heard of, uh, and tell me if, if one of your other classes has talked about this. Is, is, oops. Is, has anybody talked about this one for 2016? Really? No. Really, Dr. Reinemann, Mr. Surf Guy has not talked about this interest. Okay. So a couple of things seem to really um, engender a lot of anger with regards to the Coastal Commission. Uh, access. Uh, again, they have they have all of the all of those charges um, that we we discussed, we went through. Um, coastal dependent industries, all this and that, but, but access really seems to be one thing that really ticks people off and really gets people angry. The other is when um, people are not permitted to do whatever they want on their, to their house or their private property. That's another huge one. And then we have some of these things that, uh, this, this last category that, which is right here, that is maybe not a, um, how would I say it? Not a traditional coastal management thing, but some of the interpretation that the commission um, will, will take. And so in this case, we're talking about Mavericks. If you guys aren't a surfer, this is bi a big, this is a, an area up near Santa Cruz where the, the topography of the bottom of the ocean of the shelf right there is really, really funky. And just is this very unique way of funneling in when we have a certain swell from a certain direction, usually wintertime storms. Um, that come out of the south, south, uh, southwest, I think, um, uh, and just make these huge, massive, massive waves. So when, when the conditions seem to be right, the folks that run this contest, and the contest doesn't happen every year. If, if the conditions don't, don't occur, it doesn't happen. But when it looks like, oh my God, it's gonna, in 10 days, we're gonna have this condition, the calls go out to folks across the world and they say, hey, big, big wave surfers, 
be at Mavericks on whatever, November 5th, because we're going to start in the, in the surfing competition. This happens for a couple days, et cetera. So because it's in the coastal zone, because a lot of people will come to the beach and watch and all this and that, it, it's a permitted activity, right? It's huge revenue generator, huge crowds, all that kind of stuff. And so they have to get a, a permit. Now, normally getting a permit is relatively easy, but um, a few years ago, uh, there, there was a change. And so um, up to that point, only dudes were, uh, were surfers. But the Coast Commission, uh, was getting ready to approve this and, and some advocates said, yo, 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 why are we permitting a, um, a what they call the discriminatory practice to go on? Why isn't, why are, and this, these folks are using our coastal zone and all this and that, why aren't we allowing women to surf? And so uh, anyway, so, so they, they broke the, the virtual glass ceiling as it were on, on the Maverick surf competition. Um, this is a category of the type of things that, that uh, I don't mean to discount um, equality or anything like that. I don't mean that, but, but it's one of those things that's not the primary task of the Coastal Commission, but yet these are the kind of things that, that often generate a lot of news and a lot of um, energy on both sides. People say, it's the best thing ever. And other people say, what are you doing involved in this? This is, this is not your purview, right? Um, stick to your more focused regionalism uh, goals. So anyway, so, so these are the kind of things that tend to generate a lot of the, the intense feelings, positive and negative, towards the Coastal Commission. Okay, so I want to run through an example here, and then we'll take a break and have you guys do a little bit of an exercise. Um, questions so far about that stuff? Okay, so uh, let's run through an example of how uh, a more typical um, type of interaction with the Coastal Commission might uh, might run. Um, and also just uh, unmute and just tell me, you guys, have you have you guys gone through this in terms of uh, sea level rise exercises with Coastal Commission in any of your other classes? No, I've been, I've no. been away for you know no. class for two years, so I don't I don't know. If, okay, okay, all right, cool, thanks. Okay, so. So here we go, let's run through how this might work. Okay, uh, global warming. Yes, we know it's real. Okay, good, so global warming is going on. Global warming is gonna induce some amount of sea level rise. Sea level rise is gonna cause some problems. Um, just to be clear here, all of our estimates of sea level rise have been way too conservative, right? Virtually every single metric that, we, that the IPCC has predicted has been an underestimate, an underestimate of the melting of glaciers, an underestimate of the rate rising of sea water, all that, all that stuff. But um, for the purpose of this, we're just going to say yes. We're going to use the existing predictions, which are too conservative. The, the sea is almost assuredly going to be rising higher than the levels that are typically talked about for 2050 and 2100. Okay, so this higher wave break or or or, or surf breaks um, higher, in particular winter storms during high tides that are breaking higher will lead to more coastal erosion. That coastal erosion is going to cause some bluff erosion, et cetera. <clears throat> and so here is uh, near where I grew up in Northern California, where I was born. <clears throat> and this is uh, in the Pacifica Daily City area. And check this out. This is this um, uh, apartment co complex. And, you know, <laughs> Maybe if you're one of the people over here, maybe you're okay. But if you're on these apartments, you got a, a kick butt view, right? It'd be great to have a party in that, you know, a non COVID party in, in one of those places, right? But um, maybe not to own it because, because what you maybe can't quite see here is the edge of the cliff is right, literally right there. And this is being undercut. So with rising sea levels, we need to be thinking about pulling back from the edges of these areas. The question is, and so, so I, I, you know, once a year or so on one of the commissions I sit, we get a proposal for someone that says, hey, I want to put my McMansion on this cliff edge in Malibu. And uh, I get, I'm usually the one that has to say it because I'm the scientist guy on the board and I'm like, yeah, no, man, we're never, never going to approve this. No, 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 no. And a lot of people just don't seem to get it. Um, that's one thing, that's new development. That's relatively easy to deal with. 
but what about all this existing development, right? Um, I can't go in and say, rip out your house, right? I can't go in and say, rip out your, your, your backyard or what have you. And so here, herein lies the challenge. So someone wants to do something. My house is eroding and we hear this stuff all the time. And I wanna do this and this, and by the way, it's my property, right? And people will quote the Fifth Amendment and they'll say things like, the Fifth Amendment says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation, right? So by you not allowing me to protect my cliff, you are in effect, Coastal Commission, you are in effect taking my property. So that's fine. Go ahead, you can take my property. And by the way, pay me. And my, my, the land value alone of my coastal property is, who knows, $3 million or something, right? So why don't you give me $3 million? And then, oh, by the way, my house costs another, I don't know, $2 million or something. So why don't you give me you know, $5 million for my trouble? And if you're not, you're, you're, you're anti-American and blah, 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 blah. The part of the Coastal Act that this is in, uh, uh, um, um, governed by is the notion that developments, new developments will reduce risk to life and property in area of, of elevated geological hazard. I'll just note here, it also includes fire hazard. We typically have historically thought about this as geological erosion, the sediment moving down, moving away. Um, these, these new developments will assure stability and structural integrity, neither create nor contribute significantly to erosion, geological instability, or destruction of the site or surrounding area. So all this sounds like, hey, if, if we've said that houses are okay in this area, it sure sounds like we should be able to, you know, concrete up our house and, and make our house, uh, you know, bunkerized and able to survive whatever the sea is going to throw at us. So this is how it'll typically uh, uh, work out. So I have my house on my on this bluff, let's say, in, in Malibu, and uh, I want to I want to you know do something. I want to put a, a, a hot tub out there, or I want to put a I guess a hot tub. You just put a hot tub out, but a bit, but you know, I want to add on a extra bedroom or something like that nature. So I would put my um, petition in. It would eventually make its way to the Coastal Commission staff. Let's say you are one of our Coastal Commission staff members. And so then you're going to get called out. Hey, yo, uh, you need to go out next week to this address and go do an inspection. So you're going to go out and you're going to maybe take, well, these days you probably use one of our drones and, uh, and, and do structure from motion to get the topology. But the way we did it, you know, recently and still probably a lot of the Coastal Commission because they're not the most necessarily technologically savvy folks, they might do this by hand, where the, the old standard methods that you guys will learn in water resources when you take that, um, which is just a, a, a transit line. And so here we go. And so here we went. And um, in let, let's say this, this date is from 1997, but it could be any old time, right? So we went and we mapped the green thing, right? So we, we put a marker in the sand or wherever we, we had our permanent marker, and we measured. And we went uh, from the beach, let's say, up the cliff, onto the plateau, and let's say my house is, is right here, up to where my house is, okay? Took these measurements, went back, and uh, hung out for a while, for, you know, six months or, or whatever, before the winter, come back after the winter kind of deal. So we go back out there, and we redo it. We do the same thing, right? Follow the same transect, and then we get this red, uh, red profile, okay? And so we go, okay, there we go. This is X number of months, or let's say we just went through the really intense winter storm season. So let's call it maybe um, the loss for one year. And so we can measure how quickly this bluff right here is retreating, right? So we can calculate the bluff retreat rate. So this, this plateau is going landward at X number of meters per year. Okay, got that. Now I propose putting, let's say this is right here is where my, uh, uh, extra bedroom is going to go. And this is my permit in front of the Coast Commission. I go, yep, I want to put my extra bedroom here and da, 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 da. So then you, the staff member would say, ah, okay. So if it's going back at whatever this is, you know, 10 meters or 15 meters or something a year. Okay. So that will last one year, two year, three years. Your, your bedroom extension is going to be lasting for three years. Um, that doesn't quite make sense, right? So what, what instead they would say, uh, you know, 
look at the financial things and stuff and say, hey, so presumably if you're going to make all this investment, you want to be able to use your bedroom for 30 years or 15 years or whatever, whatever the um, lifespan ends up being. And so if you said, hey, 30 years, okay. And let's say this is, this is uh, moving at, you know, 10 meters a year, right? So that would say to get the mat, to get the effective um, economic lifespan out of that investment or that development or whatever, you got to have 300 meters of land, right? So that, so you can't put your, your, um, we're not going to permit your extra bedroom if it's, if it's in, you know, this area, you have to, maybe on the other side of the house, maybe on the street side of the house, maybe that is within the, the economic lifespan. But, um, but that's in essence how it would work with different settings, there's different calculations or different measurements, but that's the basic idea, right? Um, so that's one type of approach. The other approach is what we're seeing more and more and more. Sorry, does that make sense? What I said so far, you guys? Everything cool with that? Any questions about that? Yeah. That was good. Okay. So um, another uh, uh, case, so, so that, 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 that's very common, or this is my private property, I wanna do something, why are you telling me I can't do it? The other one that engenders a huge amount of anger and lawsuits and threats to change the Coast Commission, all that, is an example like this. So I'm gonna, I'll share some of my coastal characterizations with you guys, um, but uh, you'll see some of this in some of the, those. So this is a classic uh, California coastline and uh, particularly in places like Southern California, densely populated Southern California, but this could you know, really be anywhere. Here's where the houses have gone in and these houses were originally built and this bluff was much farther out, right? So this, so this is a deck and they probably had you know, some gardens and all this, all this and that. Actually, let me pause. You guys tell me about it. You, you guys read this picture here. Tell me some of the things you see uh, that you can glean from this particular uh, cliffside as we look up from the beach where the perspective of the photo was taken. Anybody? Any Anything you can glean from what's going on here? It looks like they put a seawall on the one part, but it's still. So um, Rami, which, which part are you talking about? On the right here? On the right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. And they're so, trying to drain, get the water to drain rather than undercut it, I think. Yep. So this is, so so what, what she's talking about everybody right here, this sort of um, uh, uh, semi-curved um, structure, right? So that's poured concrete. And that, that generally is poured straight onto the dirt or, the, or the, the sediment surface, the soil surface, right? And so that's probably what's going on right here. But if you're following me on the screen, so look over here, check it out. This is like, it's, a, it's like a cave. It's like, a, like ice cream scooped out from underneath it, right? So that means that all of this sediment is gone away, right? All of this material is no longer there. And that means that I guess it's probably okay to stand right here. But if you go stand right here, there's there's not much holding you up, right? So you very well could could collapse off and and fall into the uh, beach and become a 1970s episode of Columbo or something, right? Um, uh, good. What else? Somebody else tell me something else they can read from this um, image. Just based on the houses um, next to the one on the far right, it looks like that. Um that pipeline that's coming down, that looks pretty new. So they're still probably yeah. living there trying to like mitigate those issues where as the people on the left seem to have given up. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I, I, I believe when this photo was taken, I think people are, all these three um, houses are, are still, res, we're still active residences. Yeah. So yeah, right, okay, great. So the piping, this is a classic, classic, classic one, right? So um, this is a, a relatively wide pipe. So this is a drain pipe. Why would you put a drain pipe in? You shouldn't, generally speaking, need a drain pipe unless you're irrigating your landscape, unless you are putting plants there that um, either need or you think need a lot of water 
and you and and I almost guarantee that none of these people grew up in these houses. And so they didn't, they haven't been, their family hasn't been living here for 70 or 100 years or whatever. Um, and so they probably moved in, not meaning to be jerks or not meaning to be stupid or, or anything like that, but they just didn't know. And they took the practices from, I don't know, the San Fernando Valley or, I don't know, Irvine or wherever the heck it is. And they just said, hey, let's put in, I like this flower. Let's put this flower in. Let's put this, um, this succulent here. Let's water this, this succulent. And so all that water has to go somewhere, right? Check out this. Well, maybe you guys can tell us, maybe you can't. This is, there's a lot of sandstone. This is mostly sandstone, right? This isn't big granite. This is not like we're on the, the, you know, climbing the half dome in Yosemite. It's not that kind of stuff. It's very erodible, erosive, um, what we can call friable soils, okay? So um, after the damage has been done, Right. Okay, so there's, there's two sources of possible erosion. So one is us watering up here and weakening the soil, okay? The other is undercutting from the, from the toe down here by that sea level rise, so the waves pounding away. And in reality, a lot of this is both of them at the same time. And so because this watering is eroding this stuff, these guys are like, oh my God, let's put a drain pipe in, <laughs> right? So let's still put all of our crap water on the beach right? But let's just uh, make it jettison really quickly over the sandstone, right? That seems not a desirous thing from a community level. Okay, good. So we got that going on. So we got this, we got this poured concrete face. We got this new uh, drain pipe. And it looks like there was maybe one right here too, this white one right here. What else do you guys see? Is that an access point on the right where that fence yes. is? Yes, this was a private walkway from, and you'll see this a lot in these uh, developments, a private stairway down to the beach. So this house, you know, this house, the one right next to it, I don't really, I can't remember which one, but but yeah, so this this little area where my cursor is, this was, and you guys can see my cursor, right? When I move it on the screen? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And so and so this this was this was like a, a stone walkway, concrete walkway that came down and then kind of went like this. But as all this cliff came down, it took that out. And you'll see this all over the place in these threatened um, uh, hi uh, hillsides. One of the first things that'll go is um, this old, and a lot of times they're, they're very rickety. They're very kind of made out of wood from, you know, 1964 kind of thing with some nails from like 1952. And so they're usually not the most robust structures ever built. Um, and because of the Coastal Act, if you wanted to, you know, re-up your, your stairway or whatever, you have to get a, a development permit. So that sort of leads to this feedback loop of, well, okay, I don't want to mess with it. Don't and then it gets more rickety and all that kind of stuff. So that was an access, that was a private access way to the beach. Yes, probably one of the reasons these people bought this because so that they could walk down to the beach and hang out on the beach or surf or whatever. Okay, good. Anything else you guys see here in the in the picture or that we can glean? Okay. Professor, I don't know what it is, but all of those little white stickers over on the far left. Yes. Yes, so this is another way to attempt to deal with storm run up or, or wave wash. So this is, <laughs> This is crazy. This is either steel cables, steel cables, bum, 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 bum. and they put these steel plates. So just like you would hang, what would it be like? Like you're, uh, I don't know. Like you know, like in the old movies when people used to tie cans and behind a car when people got married. It's like one of those. So you have these baffles, right? So this thing is hanging down. You have this, um, and then you have this white uh, PVC thing to help keep it, um, you know, straight or perpendicular to the to the cable and so the idea is when the wave hits this these are going to act as dissipative um, um, structures in the way of the wave and cut down the the speed of it undercutting the cliff crazy totally crazy right so is that a man-made mangrove yes <laughs> yeah that's the man-made jacked up screwed up baloney thing is what that is so when would they have put that in Oh, I don't know. Sometime, sometime relatively recently, but uh, but you know, probably, probably um, as this as this deck was starting to become really vulnerable, these guys 
so okay so these folks are like oh my god some bad stuff's getting ready to happen these guys are like oh my god bad stuff is happening to me right now these guys are like bad stuff's happening but we tried to fight it so these guys have put in can you see these steel pilings so these guys yeah. have erected steel pilings that have been driven way down in the sediment i don't know how far they went but but much deeper than you see here right ideally this would go down to bedrock so this would go down really far so it would be super stable but that gets really expensive the deeper you go um, so this is put in and then this is i believe a steel cross beam right here so this is just like we built a cantilevered house over a uh, over the grand canyon kind of thing right so the idea here is structurally this is going to keep this deck from falling theoretically right and so that's going to work in the short term if nothing else changed this would probably be enough to to keep this okay but because the erosion is going to keep going, you would have to have these types of pillars. You essentially have to have the house essentially on stilts, but just uh, on the ground. You get what I'm saying? You'd have to drive pilings all throughout this, the foundation of this house and then put steel underneath the house to make sure that when the, when the um, bluff eroded underneath it, you would, your house would be okay. But then you know, your house would be up in the air. So there's all kinds of craziness. So this is um, the other. So I said the first case was, hey, I want to add something to my house. The other is this. And this is this story is where we have massive um, uh, sea level rise and other induced coastal erosion. And so these folks want to save their house. And they're saying, look, man, uh, I'm not trying to be crazy. I just want to keep my house. I'm not trying to add on an extra bedroom or an extra extra you know grandma unit or whatever this is just uh what i'm trying to do to save my house and so what can you do well we can abandon this house and just say hey this is screwed we can demolish it and turn it into open space which is great if you're the community not great if you're the homeowner right and you have i don't know million dollars five million dollars whatever it is wrapped up in this house way more than a million probably you know like many millions of dollars wrapped up in this house but but that is a, in theory that is an option um we can relocate it we can do planned retreat so we could take our house we could we could we can in, th in theory we could hire a house mover jack this house up and move it back, assuming our property is large enough and move our house back, you know, I don't know, 100 feet, 200 feet, whatever, buy ourselves another 30, 40 years, something like that, right? Uh, or we could do a partial, um, we could partially demolish this part of the house and then just, you know, lose that, you know, so, so in some manner like that. So we have abandonment, we have relocation and, then, and, and, uh, we have fight. I'm going to fight it. And so this is what all most of those people are doing. They're pouring concrete, they're putting baffles down, they're doing all this stuff, and they want to have permission to, and so they're coming to the commission to get permission to dump a bunch of boulders, pour a bunch of concrete, and, and make the coast that much harder. Uh, they want to do something like this from Orange County. So now this is a classic engineering. This is very, you know, 1950s. This is very macho. There's, there's, a, there's a whole lot of testosterone. I, I can smell it off this, uh, off this wall. And uh, so what's going on here is, so there's a homeowner up here. Well, there's, there's all homeowners up here, but let's just take this guy, for example. Um, so here is their private stairway. This is their private stairway, mind you. This is not, you cannot access the coast here. This is just for the homeowners. Um, and they've come in and they've hugely armored this area. So they've poured all this concrete pillars, all this stuff. And they've, so you can see the bluff goes like this. So they've given themselves more real estate so they can have a really probably very nice deck and, and uh, outdoor space. Um, and then they've, they've it's, it's almost like mini terracing. So they have this level up here, they have this level here. And this is, I mean, look at this. This is like uh, Blade Runner, man. This is like the Death Star here. So we have all this hard concrete, a mix of concrete and uh, or, or um, of pillars and uh, bracing structures here. These 
guys here are, I don't remember this particular site. So some of these are tied into the rock. So some of these are, are drilled into the bedrock to anchor and hold the wall. So essentially to drill the wall into the ground and or drain pipes um, so that liquid can go out. Uh, and you can see some of that liquid coming out of these holes. Um, and then, uh, and yeah, and so there you go. So now this saves my house, right? So as the homeowner, I'm stoked because I got a bigger deck. I, I can probably increase my home property values. This sucker ain't going anywhere anytime soon, right? This is, this is gonna, I mean, eventually it will because nature always bats last, but, but for at least the next couple decades or so, at least I'm sitting pretty pretty here, right? Um, and then well, this guy over here did something else. This guy did the same thing. He like added a big wall. He did redid his this. And, and you can see that it looks like this guy's property is here. It looks like this wall continues on to the next, um, next property up. So as soon as I do this, now my neighbor is going to say, whoa, 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 Dr. A did that. I, I, if he can do it, I should be allowed to because that's only fair. That's equity, right? And so once you, you get one of these structures going in, there's usually rapid pressure to, to, to spread that out, to spread the, the armoring out. To, to have this very hard resistance. These are, um, well, it's a, sub, it's a judgment call, I suppose. I guess if you love concrete, maybe you like this, but I think most people would find this very ugly. So aesthetically, this is not very pleasing. And what does this do to coastal access? Check it out. If this was allowed to erode, right? So this would erode, would erode. This sediment would come onto the beach and we would have, essentially the beach would just move inland a little bit, right? Now it can't. So now as the sea level rises, this gets squeezed, so-called coastal squeeze. And so if we wanted to go on the beach at high tide, there are oftentimes, or, or well, I, don't, I don't remember this particular site, but um, Broad Beach, for example, in Malibu, these other sites, there is no beach at high tide. There literally is no Broad Beach, a place that was so named because the sand was so wide, is now in effect not accessible during any moderate to high tidal elevations. So that means public access goes away. So um, there's all the cost with this, there's all the um, impact, et cetera. And there's also that huge impact to that key um, coastal act provision of fostering public and, and protecting coastal access. Um, and so, uh, Professor, yeah. Can you, go, can you go back to that one slide? Yeah. yeah. Okay, you, you said that, um, why would the Coastal Commission allow these people to do that if if this was not their land down to the beach? You oh, oh it, 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 it could it, it could well be it probably is their land down to the beach. Okay. It's just it's just it's just their, their land ends at, at high high tide mean high or high tide. So okay. I mean I don't I don't know for sure, but because these folks have this the um, stairways on it, I'm I'm pretty sure this is this is there. They at least have a, a right of way on it. Okay. Um, so now, uh, so but I think Loretta's question is, and we're almost so we're almost up to break time. Um, but so I think if I can rephrase Loretta's question, um, what the expletive deleted, right? Why is the Coastal Commission permitting this? Uh, well, a couple of things might might allow them to permit it. Maybe this is, it's not, but, but maybe this is a public stairway, right? So maybe there's, there isn't an easy access for a quarter mile up and a quarter mile down. So maybe as the homeowner, I say, hey, check it out. You let me put in a seawall and I'll put in a stairway for myself and or I'll make a stairway that's accessible to the public. And then I'm fostering um, public access. What do you think about that? Ooh, ooh, sensei, sensei, sensei. Uh, so uh, um, th that didn't happen in this case, but, but that, that's one thing that could happen. The other thing that, that could be happening is they could just say, hey, my house is super expensive. And there was this old lame seawall from the 70s that was already here. So I should be allowed to just fix it, right? And depending on the makeup of the Coastal Commission at the time when you, when you made your petition, maybe that would win. Maybe if it's consistent with your LCP, your local coastal plan, if your town, if your county says, yep, seawalls are cool when needed to protect private property, and you're like, dude, I'm a private property owner, and maybe you're a big donor to different causes and such, 
right? It's a, it's a, um, it, it's, it's a weighing the benefits and the costs. And, and it's the 12 members of the commission that are the ones that are weighing those benefits and costs. Um, so, okay, we'll go through real quick and then it's almost time for break again, but uh, I'll just say that this is a huge source. If you guys are interested in these topics, definitely go talk to Dr. Patch. She's always doing cool research on, on sand movement and coastal erosion. She did a PhD on this topic, et cetera. Um, so uh, a really, um, really important one, especially for those of us in Southern California where so many of us live right on the coast. Um, uh, just, I already, we already discussed this, but just to, to finish this up, um, seawalls really fix the back of the beach and they ultimately always lead to a loss of, of um, what we might call towel space on the sandy beach part of it or the cobble beach part of it. Um, and so to answer uh, Loretta's question, uh, why would they permit it? Well, because uh, the Coastal Act allows them to permit it, right? So revetments, breakwaters, groins, harbor channel seawalls, cliff retaining walls, which is what that stuff was, and other such construction that alters natural shoreline processes shall be permitted when required to serve coastal dependent uses or to protect existing structures or protect public beaches, that, that wasn't the case here, but to protect existing structures, right? So that's how, that's how um, these things can be permitted because it is, it is legally allowable for the Coast Commission to permit these things. Again, it has to weigh the benefits and costs, but it is, is, it is within its purview to allow the, such structures to um, be approved. I would say, that as, as this issue gets more and more intense, we're gonna see more people dead, right? So we might see more people dead from buildings falling in the ground, but we're certainly more likely to see more people dying from um, just these erosive bluffs. As these bluffs become more erosive and erosive, a lot of people, when they go to the beach, they, um, you know, they, they, uh, they're, they're naive about these risks and it's, you know, hey, it's a place to, that's a little bit shaded or whatever. I can go put my surfboard up against there and go put my cooler against there. Um, you know, it's easier to defend my towel space over there. And, um, and this, uh, you know, every so often will happen and unfortunately um, seriously hurt or sometimes even kill people, which, which is a real issue. Um, and so, yeah, okay, so as we said, uh, what do we do when we deal with this stuff? We gotta evaluate the risk. Is it imminent? Meaning, is, is, your, is your house gonna be lost in this winter storm event or, or likely to be lost? If it's not imminent, we'll, the application will usually oftentimes be kicked down the, you know, kick the can down the street kind of thing. Um, next, people will, the staff and, and et cetera, will explore alternatives. And are we sure that this seawall in this place that you wanna put in is the least environmentally damaging? Are you sure? Is that, is, that, is that the best way? So we can look at alternatives. What if X, what if Y? Um, and one of the challenges here, and this is very, uh, this is an ongoing challenge. This isn't unique to the Coastal Commission, but um, we evaluate each case on its own merits, right? So I'm the homeowner. I'm going to work very, very hard to make my case, show all my bills and all this and that, all that great stuff. But um, the impacts are cumulative, right? This is, this is the commons issue, right? So if I put up my seawall, I might screw up the beach, but only the beach in front of my little, my property, only the couple hundred feet, right? That, that, that's my property that touches the beach. If it was only me, who cares, right? If it was just this one little part of all this whole beach, not a big deal. But the reality is when I put mine in, then my neighbor wants to put his in and then she wants to put hers in and then da 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 da, da. And so um, while each case is evaluated on its own merits, the commissioners also need to take the cumulative impact into consideration somehow. And that is, that, that's, there's, there's not a formula for that. That's always gonna be a hard thing to do. When do you decide too much is too much? And the example I usually give, um, the example I usually give of that is, um, I think we're almost done with this, is um, uh, a classic case, Lake Sherwood uh, above campus uh, uh, in Hidden Valley, if you go up Potrero and keep going, uh, wealthy development started by the Murdochs and all these people in the 70s. Um, uh, at the time, this was unincorporated Ventura County. It wasn't part of Thousand Oaks or anything like that. 
And when these folks went in and put in these, this huge development, um, augmented an existing lake and then put in a huge development where Tiger Wood, Woods plays golf, golf and tennis and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so very wealthy community. They nuked the oak trees, you know, tons and tons of oak trees, right? All over the place. Cut them down, cut them down, cut them down, put up all these mansions, cut those trees down, put up all these mansions, et cetera. At the time, that was, there was no legal um, reason why they couldn't do that. Since then, the city of Thousand Oaks has, has crept out there and has annexed more and more land and, and is protected. And now those, a lot of that region around that area is protected by um, the city of Thousand Oaks Oak Tree Ordinance, which says, if you have a big oak tree, you can't cut it down unless it's diseased or you know, burnt or something like that. And so several years ago, I was at a, a planning commission meeting for the county and this gentleman who his family owned land out there rancher type person, not a wealthy dude, um, but his family had the land. And so they, they're land rich, but not really money rich. Um, and he wanted to do something and the city denied him his permit to, to do his action. And he was really ticked off. And he, and he had a great argument, I thought. He said, um, you know what? Uh, I, I am very much a steward of the land. I consider myself an environmentalist. I support all these issues and this and that. I want to cut down a handful of trees on my property. I plant tons of oak trees, right? I love oak trees. I love this and that, but I need to cut a couple of these down. You're not letting me cut these down. Why are you not letting me cut these down? And the answer is because Thousand Oaks has lost too many oak trees, right? And so his argument was, I didn't cut those trees down. Those trees were permitted by the county to be cut down and, and by other developers and everything. So what you're saying is you allowed those folks to get away with murder, right? To slaughter all these trees. But I, that want to take a more responsible view, I have to now pay the price. And the answer from the county and the city was, yep, sorry, sucks, but it's true. And so what they were articulating there is this notion between evaluating each case as individual and the cumulative impacts. So at some point we decide, oh, there's too much of this. And then we, we, you know, we pull up the rope, we pull up the ladder and nobody else can engage in that practice anymore. But it's, it's uh, when do you make that call, right? Do you make that call now? Do you make that call a year from now? Do you make the call when 10% of the coastline is armored? What's the, what's the call? And there is no magic number right now. And so that's one of the key coastal management things we're struggling with right now, which are these things where there isn't a, a cut and dry answer, but we need to make calls and, um, and, and they're, they're difficult. They're just, they're difficult. There's, there's no other way to say it. Um, uh, I think when we talk about coastal management, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about, right? I mean, this is real policy. Um, these decisions that are made to allow this um, seawall and screw public access, or not allow the seawall and maybe screw this homeowner over, neither, neither of those is ideal, right? I mean, we're, we're in a, a tough situation because of the poor decision and the poor planning we made back in the day. So we're forced into these options. Um, it really helps to review case studies. So we mentioned a lot of these um, commissioners are new folks. Maybe you are new to the issue. So it really helps to go and review what happened when we permitted that, that one five years ago, right? Has it, what's the beach look like underneath it? So the so case studies are very powerful in this as, as we're sort of feeling our way through this to give insights in and potentially forecast what might happen if we do decision X or decision Y. Role playing, I think really, really helps here where you take on the role of the developer, the developer takes on the role of the Coastal Commission, et cetera. Role playing sounds stupid and lame and kind of, kid-like or whatever, but it actually, I found it really does help um, force people to see from other people's perspectives. That won't work for everyone, but for folks that have an open mind, I think it does help them give a sense uh, of what the, the quote unquote other side um, is, is having to deal with. Um, okay, so uh, I'll just say there's, there are other regional agencies. We're running out of time here. Uh, SCAG, Southern California Association of Government is an example, another example of regionalism. Again, the Coastal Commission is one example of this increasing trend towards regionalism to deal with these challenging uh, resource management issues. Um, yeah, we don't have to talk about SCAG, we'll just mention it exists. Metropolitan Water District is another one of these regional entities um, which operates in these um, uh, cities. 
And with these water districts, so it's a mix of counties, cities, and water districts, and, and they um, do all kinds of stuff related to supplying uh, water uh, for us. They have a 37 member board. And that's all I wanted to say about that. Cool, questions, questions about uh, our introduction to the Coastal Commission. I don't know, I was wondering if you could comment on that thing that was said before. Um, these people are saying that their property is, the property, they, they say their property is being taken for public use, but it, if the Coastal Commission can go in and say, hey, look, we're going to take your property, they say, they're not really taking their property because the right. property is going down into the ocean. So right. how, can, how, how is it necessary that the state needs to go in and pay these people for the property that's no longer there? Uh, right. And, and that and that doesn't that doesn't uh, happen. Right. So uh, unless the unless you were saying, hey, I'm going to turn this over for a public park or a public access way, then the state might might pay for it. But you're right. The state doesn't routinely pay for it. But but that's what the homeowners want or, or that's what folks that are being denied um, the ability, excuse me, the ability to establish a seawall or some other protective structure. That's what they'll say. They'll say, in effect, by you denying me the right to protect my land, you are taking it. I, I agree that that um, that is certainly dubious uh, legally whether that's that's the case or not. I would say that there is a, a very concerted effort among certain folks to influence the courts for this exact issue, this exact issue, to get more folks that um, believe in the interpretation of the Fifth Amendment and, and private property uh, to, um, uh, to, to say they can do whatever they want on their land. I, I think one of the best retorts to that is, um, so the argument is, well, I can, I'm allowed to do whatever I want on my land, and the fact that you're not allowing me to do whatever I want is amounts to a taking, and therefore you need to pay me if you don't want me to do that, if you don't want to put in a seawall or whatever, right? I think logically, I don't see the difference between doing child pornography on someone's in someone's house, right? So you can make the same argument. Hey, this is my house. I want to do child pornography and make a bunch of money. And you're you're saying your laws are preventing me from from doing this this activity or or whatever, having a meth lab or something like that on my property, right? And so so I should be able to do it because because the, the Constitution says I can use my property however I want. Clearly, our society has said some things like making child pornography, like brewing methamphetamines uh, is not a legal act, whether it's on private property or public property. And so, yes, it is true that theoretically your property could be used to, to generate all those drugs or something, which would be worth X number of gazillion dollars or whatever, right? I don't think it would fly if a criminal were to say, hey, you have to let me, you have to let me make my methamphetamines or you give me, I don't know, $10 million, right? That wouldn't fly. And so I would suggest that this is of the same, same caliber. Um, I would say that, that not everyone agrees with this position I've just articulated, but um, that to me seems to be a, a logical retort to that, that argument. But there are cases that are setting precedents where states are going in and buying these people out so that they'll leave that coast, even though there's nothing left there. Yes, and in fact, so you're absolutely right. And I think where this is happening more quickly is um, not necessarily in the coastal zone, but in fire areas and areas that are particularly vulnerable to fire. Where, oh. In fact, in fact, that, that, that in a sense is what's on the ballot in, in a week and a half or so, or at least, at least part of what is on one of the ballots about the notion of we wanna make it easier for folks to sell their property, right? That is say, well, it, it seems to be wrapped in a wildfire element, but, but I don't think that's the, the real original reason, even though that's what, what's talked about in, in the arguments. But it, what it amounts to is, is, is essentially a, a subsidi subsidizing people moving. Whether you think that's good or not, I'm not trying to pass judgment, I'm just saying, but in effect, we're, we're doing some amount of subsidizing um, um, people to, to do those types of behaviors. The reality is all the stuff we do is influencing our behaviors, tax policy, local ordinances, all these things uh, influence us. And it seems to be sometimes people 
say that the government, quote unquote, is influencing us when they don't like the influence um, uh, in these situations. But cool. Other questions before I let us go for a break? Thank you. We're a bit over. Okay, uh, 10 minutes. You guys take a stretch and come back, and I will see you in 10 minutes. Ready, set, go.